It's my great pleasure to introduce <laughs> renowned horticulturalist and my longtime mentor, Miley Arnold. I'm so glad you could join us today. Thank you, Milo. Anyway, I thought I'd talk a little bit about how, even though I was trained as a scientist, it informed the way I looked at my life. I have, I'm still looking at the world that way. And I think part of it had started out as a child. I ran around. We had total freedom in Hawaii growing up. Wonderful wild ecosystems, including the water, the reefs, all of that. And I spent a lot of time looking at things as I was running around and asking questions. Well, why, why are there plants here and not there? Why is the seaweed this color in this part of the reef and that color on another part of the reef? And of course, I had no way of really finding out. So that was the start of my life. I have always been looking at what was around me and trying to figure out, well, why is it this and why is it that? I went off to college and majored in biochemistry, did a lot of research which was fun, found out things to question, you know, the scientific method, which we informs the way we look at life, where you get an idea and then you set up a way of testing it and you test it and you see what happens. So, and then I went off to graduate school and got a master's again in the science area, more ecology at this point. And then I got married and had children which was pretty normal for women in the 50s. Got married and had children and still wondering about things. And I started growing a garden. My job was to raise all of our food, including the animals. And I raised a lot of food for the animals because I didn't like the idea of all the chemicals that were in the feeds. So, I came to this whole idea of trying out things in the garden. What if I do this? What if I do that? So my garden helper, Pedro, and I did a buon experimento, as he said it in Spanish. And always before, I had a rototiller, and I would rototill. And then we decided, well, let's do half of the corn patch by tilling and half of it, let's try something else. So out of that came this little talk I'm gonna share with you, what we discovered and what I am still doing. And interestingly enough, the, our earth is going, is having a very hard time. There's a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide that is building up in the atmosphere. It is making a thick, dense blanket that you can't see. But as a biochemist, I can picture these three-dimensional molecules hooking up with each other and making this blanket, which holds the heat in, just as you were to sit inside of a window on a cold winter day, the sun coming through warms the room, even though it's still cold outside. So that is what is happening. So it turns out that this way, this, the results of this one experimento that Pedro and I did helps to keep the carbon in the soil. And that's what plants do. They put carbon in the soil. Now what I do and what I teach my clients to do is to plant a cover crop anytime that the soil is bare. Anytime that there is not, there are not plants growing in the soil. And the, why, why do we need to do this cover crop? The first reason is carbon sequestration. Plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and deposit it in the soil, which can help to diminish the amount of greenhouse gases. Now we all know, we all know that, um, that plants photosynthesize and they make sugars, and those sugars then get turned into all of these other things. So you can see this layer of, of blanket of, of gases, the gray on this slide, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, all of those happen when you burn 
when you burn petroleum, essentially that's how it's getting there. You're, you're burning petroleum. So the light wave has a very short wavelength. It's called the amplitude. It's teeny, teeny, tiny. So it can go through a window. It can go through the atmospheric layer. Those, that blanket that we're building up on the outside. And then when it hits a surface, it bounces back as a heat wave, which has a big amplitude comparatively. Again, it's the, it's the size of the wavelength. So that big, that big wave goes up into the atmosphere, it bounces off, it bounces off those, uh, that thick blanket, and it, um, it stays as heat, and it's why we're heating up. Okay, so now we'll get back to the cover crops. When are they planted? They're planted when the soil is bare. And why are they needed? One of the things that happens is that plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and deposit it in the soil. We know, we've known for many, many years that plants put carbon dioxide into their bodies. What we are only learning more about now, more recently, we are learning that they put it into the soil. They pump sugar into the soil, which feeds all of the creatures that live in the soil, which are called symbionts. They, are, they help the plants, as well as the plants feeding them. They help the plants scavenge nutrients and water and, and different kinds of things anyway. And they also even make pesticides plants are attacked by insects. Okay, so cover crops, you plant whenever the soil is bare, in the winter, you plant in the fall when the crops are harvested. So now in my garden, we've had hard frost. So the tomatoes and peppers and squash and corn, all of that has died. So I am starting to plant these cover crops. And these are the different types, the grasses. And here are some examples of grasses, legumes, which actually not only will put this carbon into the soil, but they will also add nitrogen because there are little guys who live in the, in the nodules on the roots, which can fix nitrogen. And then the brassicas, and we're gonna talk more about what the brassicas do in a minute. Okay, in the summer, if you have winter crops that you pull up, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the cabbage, then you want to plant something else. And here are some examples of things that you can plant in the summer that would like to grow in the summer. The winter crops will grow in the cold weather. The summer crops won't. So buckwheat, Phacelia tanacetifolia, which is an incredible pollinator plant. It's absolutely beautiful. And then these other things. Okay, so here is my cover crop of mixed brassicas where I grow corn. And it's growing all winter long with the winter rains. And the time to cut it down, when it's the, about 50% of the bloom, there is the most oomph, the most amount of nutrients in the cover crop at 50% bloom. In the winter, the nutrients that were in the soil left over from the summer with the winter rains tend to wash away. And it's why at the bottom of the Mississippi River, there's a giant dead zone because the crops, the fields that are planted, the thousands of acres of, of crops that are planted in the Midwest in the summer, if those, soil, if those soils are left bare in the winter, the winter rain washes the residual nitrogen and other kinds of fertilizers down the Mississippi River. And there is a dead zone at the bottom of the river that is now the size of Massachusetts. It was Rhode Island, but it is now Massachusetts. And what happens is that all that fertilizer causes, it causes um, seaweeds and bacteria in the, in the water to grow. 
and they grow tremendously because of all of this fertilizer, enormous amount of fertilizer that washes down the Mississippi. So you have a huge algal bloom. In other words, it grows like crazy. They call it a bloom. And then it dies. And when it dies, it uses up, the, it breaks, is broken down by the bacteria in the water. And it uses up all the oxygen. So that whole huge area is anoxic. So no fish can live, no shrimp, no, there was a tremendous uh, fish uh, and shrimp industry down at the bot in that area, Louisiana. And it's gone. And it's gone because there's no oxygen in the water because of this dead zone. If instead the farmers had planted the cover crops, they would have taken into the bodies of them. You can see, you can see the bodies of the, the body of the mustard and the daikon radish, etc. All of those nutrients that went wash down the river would have ended up in these plants in the winter and would not have gone down the river and would be there for the next year's crops. So here we are with the mixed brassicas. So what I do is I chop it down with a weed eater. So it's all chopped down, it's very coarse looking. And then I cover it with something opaque like a tarp or weed control for a number of options for covering and let it sit for a month. And it just sits there and underneath it's breaking down all the bacteria in the soil are loving all the nutrients that were in those plants and they are multiplying like crazy the earthworms are multiplying all of the creatures in the soil are chomping down and this is what it looks like after a month it looks as if it has been rototilled but look how dark and rich that soil is and then six weeks later there's the corn and the other thing that the cover crops do is they keep the weeds from growing in the winter. So very few weeds in there compete with my corn. So what happens above the soil with cover crops? The plant's leaves make sugars, which feed the plant. The plant's leaves break up the impact of raindrops, preventing soil compaction. That's something we don't think about. Bare soil, the rain doesn't feel very hard. It's like little tiny hammers banging down on top of the soil, squishing it. And what's wrong with that? When the time comes for the rain to go in and stay in the soil, it doesn't. It can't, they can't get in, so it washes away and it runs off. The other thing that happens, as I said, the soluble nutrients that were in the soil accumulate in the biomass, in the, in the bodies of those plants that are growing all winter. And then later, the flowers provide nectar and pollen to jumpstart the, pollen, the populations of pollinators and beneficial insects. So these things bloom very early and they, put, they have copious amounts of pollen and nectar. And so it gets the bees going, the native bees going, and it also starts something that I will talk to you about probably in the spring. It starts the populations of the pred predaceous insects that keep your, so your garden clear of bad, of things that are eating it. Okay, so let's go. What's going on here? All right, below the soil. So now we talked about what happens above the soil. Below the soil, all of the legumes, the fava beans, the vetch, the things that I talked about a minute ago, they fix nitrogen because in their, there are nodules on their roots with bacteria that get, they get food, carbon, sugars from the plant. And these bacteria then can grab nitrogen out of the air and fix it so that so that the plant can get nitrogen and the bacteria that lives in these nodules get sugar. So this is an incredible thing to get nitrogen 
out of the air, nitrogen gas, out of the air, into the soil in a, far, in a form which plants can use. If we do it, if we do it ourselves, humans do it, it requires an incredible amount of petroleum. It takes a lot of energy to fix nitrogen. However, here are these plants have these little creatures who do it for nothing. All they do it for is a little sugar. And there's another guy named Azotobacter that if you have plenty of mulch on the soil, it loves the carbon in the mulch and it will, it can also get fixed nitrogen out of the air. Okay, so the next thing that happens is that the sugar from the roots feed the soil microbiota. It's phenomenal to even think about how many kinds of creatures live in the soil. We can't see them. We know about the big guys, about the earthworms and, and some of the little bugs that we can see running around. But what we can't see, gargantuan amounts of other kinds of creatures, bacteria, fungi, um, anyway, all kinds of things along that line that we can't see that are all beneficial. So the sugar from the roots of the plants are feeding those things, and in return, they are, um, they are doing work for the, for the plant. The other thing is the microbiota in the soil create pore spaces. Remember I talked about how the rain beating down on the soil compacts it, which makes it hard for water to be stored in the soil. The microbiota, because they're all crawling around, they create pore spaces, which will store the water that comes down in the winter. And then the other thing is that the byproduct of this is carbon is sequestered in the soil. The carbon is coming from the sugar, which the plants make by combining carbon dioxide and water and use in chlorophyll. And they make that sugar and then the sugar, that sugar all ends up back in the soil. And then you saw a few minutes back, daikon radish. It has a huge, large, deep, white root, which can go down as far as six feet into the soil. They're huge. You cut the top off, and the whole thing rots and makes incredible channels for rainwater to penetrate, rainwater and oxygen to penetrate into the soil. And the other thing I told you, we talk about mustard. Anything, all the plants in the mustard family are very high in, in a chemical called isothiocyanate, but especially mustard. And that isothiocyanate will actually kill harmful fungi and nematodes in the soil. I tend to grow my tomatoes in the same ground year after year. It's just too hard to move everything around in my garden. And what happens with anything in the tomato, potato, um, in that family is that uh, fungus builds up and causes something called blight. There's early blight and late blight. And this year, a number of my clients had very bad late blight in their tomatoes and they their tomato crop was really cut back. So this isothiocyanate that comes out of the roots of the mustard will kill those harmful fungi. And in my garden, I'm up to the fourth year now of growing tomatoes in the same land. And I have a friend who's a longtime gardener who calls herself the blight inspector. And she even, she came yesterday and looked in my garden and I still don't have blight. <laughs> so it's working. And evidently it will also help because for strawberries because strawberries also have trouble with fungus and diseases in the soil. And then, so I grow between my strawberries, I grow this mustard also. Here is the, a diagram of the carbon sequestration. CO2, which is in the atmosphere, is necessary for plants. They are able through photosynthesis they are able to pull it out of the air and to sugar. We can't about sugars. 
and those sugars then go into the roots and decompose and make humus, which feeds the soil fauna and microbes. Oops, we're going the wrong way. Okay, here we go. Here's the chemical formula. Water plus carbon dioxide with make sugar, and then oxygen is given off as a byproduct. And interestingly enough, until this process evolved millions and millions of years ago, it was not possible for animal cells to survive because we all need oxygen. And the oxygen really was very low in our atmosphere way back. And once the plants got going and started pumping oxygen into the air, then we were able to evolve. Animals were able to evolve slowly because they needed the oxygen uh, to run their, their bodies, to release the energy in their bodies. So the sugar molecules become part, every part of the plant and are pumped by the roots into the soil to attract and feed the soil biota, which in return make nutrients available to the plant. I keep pushing this, this concept. It's so important. And it's something that when I was taking biology many years ago, we didn't know about. We knew about photosynthesis, but we didn't know about, about how those molecules were pumped into the soil. When you turn the soil, till turn to the soil, that sugar, which is that molecule on the left, the lower left, and then oxygen from the air, which gets pushed into the soil by the tilling process, turns into water and CO2. So that stored carbon goes back into the air. And to me, one of the most important things that we can think about is we're not going to stop driving cars. We're not going to stop using fuel. So if we can instead slow down or stop turning the soil and let the plants do their work, we might be able to, to counter some of that. And we really need to do this. So the other thing that happens when you till is you break up the mycorrhizae, which are the roots of the fungi, and all the biota, they all die and they break down and the carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. So here are the pore spaces that I talked about. Chemical, you could see in the left illustration how that water is beating down on the soil. There's very little organic material in the soil and the, and the microbiota are not there. They have not created their pore spaces. So the water just runs off. Add a little organic material to the soil or put a mulch on it and some of it will go in. But you see on the right, a statistic that to me is really important, especially living in California where we don't have any rain in the summer. Raising organic material 1% will retain an extra 20,000 gallons of water per acre. Now that's huge. It's why when we think back in the beginning of this talk, when I showed you my corn and said, I only have to water it every 10 days, it's because I have all those pore spaces in the soil and this water stays there. It doesn't run off. It's really important. And the farmers in the Midwest, the young farmers who are learning to plant cover crops and not till a few years ago, were the only ones that had a corn crop because there was no, it was a drought and all the fields that were done in the traditional fashion, which is to turn the soil, leave it bare all winter long, they did not hold on to the water and there was only 15 inches of rain and they didn't get a crop. It just, got, it just came up about three feet and that was it, dried up. While these young farmers who were not to see Bill, all got a crop. It's incredible. And every talk I ever give always has to end with beauty because I am now a landscape designer. And I find if I can get my 
my clients, if I can provide beauty in their garden, they will usually do what, what I want them to do. So in the upper left with the red flowers is, is one of my winter cover crops. It's called, it's called a winged bean. And those are actually edible, but it's a beautiful dark green ground cover over my beds with those red flowers. And it's very pretty. The lower left is a fava bean, and these, which also fixes nitrogen, as does the wing bean. The fava bean does. And those seeds I paid a dollar a piece for at the Chelsea Flower Show about 20 years ago. It's a pink flowered version. And I gave a few seeds to my dad to plant for his cover crop. And my mother liked it so much, she kept cutting it for the house. <laughs> really, really made him unhappy. She kept cutting down his, his fava beans to make flower arrangements because she thought that color was so pretty. So the upper right is buckwheat, which is a summer cover crop. And it, again, is loaded with pollen and nectar for the bees, for all of the pollinators. And it makes seeds that are edible for humans but it's, it's better if you not let it go to seed because otherwise it be, almost can become a weed in the garden. The lower left is a field pea, which makes edible peas, but it also makes a tremendous amount of biomass. Biomass means, means that all of the growth of the plants that's above ground. And then in the middle is a California native, which is actually a very good cover crop. And one of my friends who, <laughs> who is an organic, um, who's an organic judge in Mexico would love to have that be a weed in his garden. It is a weed in my garden now. It's in bloom right now. It keeps coming up. Phacelia tanacetifolia, incredibly full of nectar and pollen. The bees go crazy for it. It's very beautiful. And it makes a tremendous amount of cover crop. So if you want to follow through on these, these concepts, these ideas that we talked about, one thing, fine gardening, the last two issues have, have covered some of this. So with fine gardening, the last two issues, one is on cover crops and one is on, is on the soil microbiota and how important it is. There's a film that one can see on Netflix called Kiss the Ground. And it has all of these same ideas in it. And then there is a book called The Soil Will Save Us, which again goes through all of the science. I haven't gone deeply into the science, but it goes through the science and talks about how the the land-grant universities in the Midwest are teaching the young farmers to sequester carbon by doing this. Thank you, thank you Miley, so much. I think we're, we're, it's time for our Q&A. Yeah. And so okay. um, we have a question uh, here. Uh, what uh, specific advice could you offer to teens for what they could do to help combat climate change? Uh, and... Um, specifically regards to the uh, cover cropping. What could teens do? Okay, everybody's, everybody has a yard, or not everybody, but most people have some ground around where they live. Start planting it. And um, I've shown you some plants that you could use, but I think locally, almost anywhere people live, they can buy fava beans. I have a friend who's up in Bashan Island, and she emailed me, and she said, my, my seed store doesn't have the mustard you talked about, but they, we do have fava beans and barley. What should I plant? I said, plant whatever, plant whatever they've got. Let it grow. And just picture that what they're going to be doing all winter long is putting, should not have any bare ground ever, if possible. Plant seeds, let them grow. And if they get too big, chop them down and leave them as mulch and the bacteria in the soil will then compost them. And Okay, and um, we have a question about your thoughts on how social justice relates to science. Uh, you mentioned some wealthy men getting involved in this, but 
What about people from other backgrounds or people who don't have access to any land or the land they have access to is, is contaminated? If the land is contaminated, the best way to clean it up is to again plant plants which will encourage these creatures who live in the soil. A lot of them will break down chemical residue in the soil. And I was reading the other day about giant clams. You know, one of the things that's happening in the ocean as it heats up is that some of these creatures in the ocean die. And they figured out that a giant clam, this clam just sitting there, filters enough for something like 100 acres of water around it takes all the pollutants and the bad stuff out. So the important thing is to, if you don't have land, encourage people who do have land, whom you know, to plant these plants and to leave them on the ground and do not turn the soil. It's so important to get those creatures in the soil because they will, they're gonna do the work. They're gonna do the work. Daniel asks, what is the best cover crop for the climate in Sonoma County? And do some seeds work better for different types of soil composition? Okay, that's a good question. I don't know about soil composition because I use all those cover crops I showed you <laughs> everywhere, depending on you know, whose garden I'm working with. They're in Sonoma County. Can I mention, am I allowed to mention a store? Sure. A, a site where one can go to buy these things? Sure. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So there's a, there is in Santa Rosa, there is a shop or store, a warehouse called La Ballester. And you can look it up online, L-E-B-A-L-L-A-S-T-E-R. And they have so many different kinds of cover crops, enormous numbers. They have the mustards, they have the grasses, they have all the fava beans, all the legumes, and, so, and they're reasonably priced. And you just go and say, I want five pounds of this and five pounds of that, and they put it into a bag for you, weigh it out and give it to you to take home. So I like to plant mustard where I am growing, growing things that in the tomato and potato family and strawberries because of the isothiocyanates that I talked about. I like to do fava beans or bell beans and vetch. Vetch is another good one because all of those grow all winter long just with the winter rain. And then they die when you chop them down. They're not perennial. I, I stay away from perennial cover crops because of the, for the grasses. In fact, I'm working with a woman who farms all the Kendall Jackson properties in Oregon. And she said her problem with cover crops is because they were using perennial grasses as their cover crops between the, the rows of grapes is that those are very strong. And after about three years, they start competing with the grapes for nutrients. And I said to her, well, why not plant the annuals that you chop down and then the nutrients go right back? And she hadn't thought of that. So she's She's practicing with the 10 acre, new 10 acre vineyard right now to see how that works out. So you want something that when you chop it down, will compost, will go back into the soil. And the baluster has all of them and you can ask a question and they'll tell you, give you ideas that maybe you didn't, hadn't thought of. It's really wonderful. I think that just about wraps up our Q and A. So, um... Thank you so much for your time, Miley, and the presentation. Okay.